Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody back to part two with Professor Jeffrey Harrison. And we're doing a deep dive now into the fun stuff and um, something about which Professor Harrison is um, certainly what I would call a, a specialist or expert on. And um, Professor, let's go with one of your law review articles. In fact, I chose a couple right around the time that um, I had entered um, law school um, that maybe had, had resonated with me. The first one is from William and Mary um, Law Review, and it's class, personality, contract, and unconscionability. And um, in fact, you quote John Lennon um, at the very beginning, um, a song, Working Class Hero, um, which I think is from 1970. I love that album. And I want to tell you that usually when I listen to that album, I listen to it as a whole. All right. Um, yeah, because it seems like every song is interrelated, if that makes sense. Um, it's, I listen to it while I'm running, Professor, which is uh, sometimes a hard run for me. Yeah. Um, it, it's a devastating, um, emotionally raw album. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I think so. Um, a great quote, though, that you have here, I'd, I'd like to read it. Um, as soon as you're born, they make you feel small by giving you no time instead of it all. Till the pain is so big, you feel nothing at all. A working class hero is something to be. And I'm going to leave it with that ellipses right there. Okay. Um, because idea. you and I know multiple interpretations from that point on, right, um, about the song. In the crux of the article, you had what I consider to be three profound ideas to transform this concept of unconscionability that we encounter in contract law. And Professor, in my experience, it's been when I argue unconscionability, no matter if it's profoundly true in the essence right of the case, you know, the landlord, tenant, um, it's, um, it's the last argument I typically throw in. Absolutely, right? yeah. And a reason for that, and um, the reason it's, I think what you talked about, modifying the doctrine of unconscionability to go from procedural to substantive fairness. Um, was the gist of your article. Can you tell us a little bit about what is typically the black letter unconscionability versus the substantive unconscionability? Yeah, well, the, the difference would be uh, whether, let's say, somebody had uh, the upper hand, uh, had more knowledge, uh, was able to speak English, and you weren't able to speak English to understand and so those are kind of the procedural things that one looks at that might lead to an unconscionable outcome. The substantive is just what, how uneven is the bargain? Um, and, and so, you know, if you're paying twice the price that anybody else is paying, then, you know, some sort of red flag should go up. Some, some, something is missing. And, um, but as you suggest, unconscionability is not a strong argument uh, these days. And the thesis of the article, of course, is that it, that it should be uh, because uh, there are so many ways in which unconscionability can uh, reveal itself. Thank you. And you just defined your first idea to transform unconscionability in contract law toward more substantive, which is, the sole question would be whether the exchange was fair. Yes. Moving away from the peppercorn, is that right? I remember we talked a lot yeah, about the peppercorn course, argument, course, right? Yeah. yeah. Whether or not the peppercorn. If all, was if all you're fair. getting is a peppercorn, it's probably unfair. <laughs> probably unfair. Great litmus test, the smell test. Um, secondly, what you said is that fairness should be a question of fact for the jury. And I think you said that the problem with judges is that um, judges may have privileged perspectives. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, I, I, think, I think it's a given that judges are from privileged backgrounds uh, 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 by and large. And um, I mean, without, without getting too uh, uh, much in, into this, I mean, really, let's face it, the laws are drafted by people in power and interpreted by people in power. And those are typically people who have had advantageous outcomes in their transactions with others. 
So they're unlikely to feel a great deal of empathy or understanding for someone who makes uh, what for them personally a deal is that they would never have made. Because their thinking is, I would never have made that deal. And, and part of the thesis of the article is that you know, people, because of their backgrounds, have different senses of what they think is fair. So if you've been paid a horrible wage your entire life and you get a $1 increase in your wage, you think it's tremendous. While other people uh, would scoff at it. And so this sort of sense of entitlement plays a big role in what you find acceptable. If you have time, just let me give you one example, which you may have Please. read about. Uh, when I was um, on the hiring committee at the University of Florida Law School, uh, we hired two people, one from a working class background, one from a privileged background. And in the negotiations, the issue was how much would they get paid for moving expenses? And the one from the working class background was told a certain amount, and she was happy as can be because she had never, nor had anybody in her family ever been in a profession where you were paid moving expenses. The person from a privileged background scoffed at it and said he couldn't possibly move for that small amount. Now, shouldn't they be sent, shouldn't they be treated the same way? and not based on their background or expectations with respect to what is fair. That's a, that's a wonderful telling example, um, I think. That's and a true example. <laughs> that's true. That's a true example, yeah. Um, that being the case and something like what we're doing now, you said that Third, any finding of substantive unconscionability should be accompanied by a form of public notice. Um, the community should be notified of individual or firm who was found to have acted unconscionably. And do you think, um, this is a later question of mine, but do you think now with the internet and with everybody having more or less a, um, a cell phone with rating systems of companies um, that they are more accountable now than they were in yeah. the past? Yeah, I, I do. In fact, I think these various rating systems, because part of the way you can get away with being unfair is to isolate people from information about what others are getting. And so the more information about, let's say, the average amount paid for a car. So you can read and see what, what the average is for a car. You're unlikely then to go in and pay $5,000 more for a car than somebody else. Uh, so it, it does help a lot, I believe. Thank you. There was something in regard to um, what you said about a question of fact for the jury. Would you advocate, for us, we are tempted. A lot of our cases are below 15,000, right? And that means they're in county court below 8,000 right now, I believe is the limit. They just changed it for small claims court. Um, we can ask for a jury trial. In fact, I think it's a, a constitutional right, in fact, to have a jury trial um, most of the time. My worry is that the party, be a plaintiff or a defendant that's asking for the jury trial, may be hit with jury fees. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a penalty actually in pace for enforcing your constitutional rights. And I'm not just putting this out there to put judges on notice, but you know what I'm saying? Sure, I mean, uh, I mean, there are costs. That's, that, that, of course, is uh, the problem in any kind of small claim, and that is, is it worth it? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you have students coming to you and they're quibbling over $500. And you want to exactly. say to them, look, we could probably win. The probability is like 60 or 70 percent. Do you really want to go through this? Thank you, Professor. That was a big eye opener for me coming from a litigation background. I'll never forget uh, maybe the first or second week I was on the job right at UF student legal student came in and was talking about the security deposit. Right. As you're talking about. Yes. Um, quite a few hundred dollars, a lot of money, you know, for our students had been scarfed by the landlord. And I said, I can't wait to, you know, file this in small claims court. And the student looked at me, Lane, I just came in for, a minute for some advice. 
you know, and now all of a sudden you're talking about court, you know, and everything else. And yeah. what I'm wondering, are our students, in other words, technically, economically disadvantaged to the point, right, where they're scared of, you know what I mean, taking some options that may be in their best interest? Yeah, I, I think what you get into here, I don't know if this is responsive completely, but assuming that you're dealing with landlords a, a lot, they're repeat players. They know how to play the game. They've done it before. The students are not repeat players. This is a one-time only, and the costs of it won't be spread over multiple interactions. Well, if you're a landlord, once you know how to play the game, the cost is spread over, you know, however many interactions there are. And so it's just, uh, they just have the upper hand. I mean, there's just no way around it. Yeah. You're right. And if our office didn't exist, right, it would be even, yeah, completely out of whack. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it, that, that that's exactly right. Thank you. Um, it, it's a great insight into that. Um, a question I had was, does this mean that even judges should take into account the disadvantaged individual's personal circumstances when rendering justice? Uh, well, of course, that opens up a lot of issues. But yeah, I believe they can uh, and should. Thank you. It's certainly something that we do when we plug things into the equation when the students in my office, right? We try to find out from a holistic standpoint what's going on in their lives, right? How did this right. legal, yeah, is the legal issue a symptom of something bigger, you know, going on as well? And if we don't analyze and address the bigger issue, it's a revolving door, right, for our students. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do uh, the second law review article, one of my favorites. It's one that you shared with me. Um, I probably don't remember a, a, a younger version of Lane coming into your office, 1994. Um, discovered that um, you certainly do the much deeper dive than me on, on film um, and, and critical film studies, as well, I would say critical legal studies. This is from Michigan Law Review. And just to give the site for our students so they can look it up, volume 87, issue 7, 1989. And it's Jean-Luc Godard and critical legal studies because we need the eggs. And it's by Professor Harrison and Professor I should say Amy Mashburn as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, as well. Um, give her full credit on that. Um, and the gist of the article, which, which correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it was basically, it was analyzing the new wave in filmmaking. And it was saying um, in terms of how it relates to critical legal studies and saying, can the new wave in filmmaking give us ideas about how critical legal studies, right, will develop yes. in the future. And um, it was critical. Um, I'm overusing critical here, but because critical legal studies, Professor Harrison, that always makes me wonder, when we say critical legal studies, does that mean all the legal studies before were non-critical? Is it kind of implied in the <laughs> remark there? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure. That's a good question. <laughs> I, let, let me ask you. Uh, basically, you had said um, in the article that critical legal studies had been around for about 10 years at that point. That's true. New wave films had been about 30 years old back in 89. And um, now critical legal studies have been around longer than the, right? The films, yes. the new wave films that you're analyzing at the time. Do you think that your hypothesis or predictions were correct in that critical legal studies would have a limited um, impact? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it, it's probably just fortuitous, but I think, yeah, the, the prediction turned out to be accurate. We, we, back when that article was written, and this is probably hard to believe, but people classified law professors as being crits or non-crits. And, it, and um, it was a very big deal if you were a crit or a non, labeled a crit or a non-crit. Now you barely ever hear the term uh, critical legal studies. Now, there, either it has fallen by the wayside as just another fad, or it's just sort of abs absorbed into conventional legal studies so that everybody has a bit of a critical take on things. And I'm not sure which, which one. 
Thank you. I, I had, um, was this term used to describe the crits, young Turks? Yes, I think so. That yeah. Um, can, can we now say, you know, um, it's been 40 years now, you know, as opposed to 10 years, can we call the middle-aged Turks, you know, at this point? Yeah, right. <laughs> that, right. yeah. yeah. The, the reason that I use that is that I, I frequently hear this um, uh, nomenclature used, right? Whenever something new comes along, the young Turks, right? Or, um, you know, oh, absolutely. Rebelling yeah, yeah, I was a young Turk one time, at one point. You were a young Turk. I I would aspire to be like you, Professor Harrison, a, a young Turk, you know, at some point. Um, still as, am aspiring to be that middle-aged Turk, I think. Um, the, the segue into Godard. Godard brought, and you referenced this in your article, and I really, I, I love talking to you today because if we can get one of my students to watch a Godard film, I think we've succeeded. Godard's innovations, um, the visibleness of technique, Right. And um, I, I don't you know, it's interesting because I know D.W. Griffith and Eisenstein, all these famous, you know, individuals that we talk about in film studies, they didn't invent. Right. These techniques of editing and cinematography and close ups, but they were certainly brought to the forefront. Right. Yes. And so Godard comes in breaking all the film conventions in terms of these editing, the jump cuts, the kinetic pace. The moving camera, the what we you know sometimes call the cinema verite style, the breaking of the fourth wall. I think I'm getting all the elements you referenced here. The visual audio non sequiturs. Um, I think of a woman is a woman. That scene where she goes in the cafe. I, I can't recall it exactly, but the right. audio and something is just off enough, right? I thought my film was misplaying or wasn't synced right first time <laughs> I saw it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, very Godardian. Um, red herrings, the distancing or estrangement, um, and moving from emotion to intellect, right, which Godard is known for. In other words, moving from the emotional involvement or attachment to a film to the intellect, right? Mm -hmm. A film is a film and it's artificial by its very nature. Um, existential, free will and determinism. Wow. And I could probably go on with a longer list, right, of these amazing um, I think you could go on more than I could at this point. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm probably parroting, you know, what you put down there, but um, I'm fascinated by Godard, um, as, as, and you know him so much better than me. Talking about Godard, I think he was talking about freeing us from the capitalism of film, okay? In other words, film was tied to economics. You had to have an audience. You had to make money. OK, and this was the if for better, or for worse, let's call it kind of the Hollywood cycle. And yeah. certainly we had indie films and things in the meantime were. And I believe some underpinnings on critical legal studies was a Marxist intellectual freedom. Right. Um, right. Um, the crits were freeing us, if I can use that word, um, from the social dominance hierarchies. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you expound on that a little bit? Well, I mean, I think what they, it, it seems almost um, uh, obvious now, but that essentially laws were written by the privileged, the interpretation by the privileged, and, uh, and that this idea that there was some objective law as opposed to subjective which was pretending to be objective, but essentially was uh, subjective and favoring the well-to-do. Uh, and, and, and I think that's what you know, critical legal studies was trying to, to uh, expose, is this kind of uh, hypocrisy uh, that, that's, uh, that, that characterizes law generally. I mean, as one of my old professors said, uh, you know, the, the professor uh, lawyers really were there to help people determine what happens to their money. <laughs> if you didn't have any money, you didn't need a, a lawyer. Uh, a and lawyer. that's essentially how it got, got started. Property and money is what it was about. It's, there's a great painting hanging in New Orleans Museum of Art. And in fact, if I can throw a link to it, I will. There's a lawyer at a table with his scribe, of course, doing all the work, right? Right. And people are bringing in these, this money, right? And right. I, I want to say probably Dutch. Right. They're bringing in all this money. They're laying it on the table. 
And of sure. course, the lawyer is shown as kind of portly, right? Privileged, right? Dripping with privilege. And there are this, it's almost like Kafkaesque in a sense that there's this, you know, um, multiple individuals that want to get the services of a lawyer, but you got to have money. You got to come from privilege, right? To right. even get there. Yeah. Um, so I understand exactly what you're saying. I would love to quote those. Um, there were six precepts um, that you quoted. Um, and um, all laws, pig law, dressed up in judges' robes. Which <laughs> it starts with it. Um, the ruling class induces consent, demobilizes opposition by masking its rule in widely shared utopian norms and fair procedures, which it then distorts to its own purposes. And number three really resonates. Um, the ruling class makes good on just enough of its promises to convince us that the system is fair and capable of improvement. That's a good um, one. That's a that's, good one. Sometimes I wonder, are we selling our students, not just in law, but across the board, somebody's going to win the lottery, Professor. And sometimes I feel like in a capitalistic culture, we're selling this idea yeah. that, hey, you get educated, you will win the lottery. Right. And you and I know um, one person's going to win the lottery, right? And, you know, we could say in education, maybe a, a few people will. But what if the stats are that you won't? Yeah. Should we be telling students the reality? You know, yeah. that's out there. Yeah. Um, it really makes me think. Of course, um, you know, I, I have to tell you that I always am a big fan of the Florida lottery because the chances you'll win are the same whether or not you have a ticket. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's a great, can I quote you on that one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have to edit that out, right? No one will take offense at that um, with it. Um, that brings up a great Godard quote. Art is not independent from economy. Economy is not independent of art. And the fun is in the way that you spend the money making a film. Right. And he said, he said that, you know, it's not the way your father told you to spend the money, right? And I'm summarizing, but, you know, Godard, I'm kind of summarizing it there. And isn't that the essence of um, artistic freedom, Professor Harrison? It's how you spend the money, right? And what you do with it. Sure. And um, essence of freedom and choice. There's a Soviet film. It, it, when I was reading your article, it reminded me of Man with a Camera. Do you know this one? Um, it's a free roving camera that ostensibly goes around Moscow, um, filming different scenes, just having a good time. It's very free. It's from, I wanna say that 1920s period uh, mm -hmm. of Soviet film before it um, took a different turn that we don't have to get into today. But um, it's, there was a lot of freedom there. It's inventive. It makes you realize that it's a film, you know, when right. you watch it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which is what Godard was doing. Um, do you think that Godard was also the discussion we were just having? Did he see humans? Was he worried about seeing humans as economic commodities? Commodities. I'm sorry, could you repeat, say that yeah. again? Was Godard worried about humans being seen as simply economic commodities? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I believe, you know, I don't know what he's thinking or, uh, but I would, I would guess yes. And I, I feel like I'm going to turn to another um, uh, director, Kubrick, in a couple of his later films. Um, when you look at prostitution, you know, the, the analysis that's going on, right, um, at the beginning of Full Metal Jacket or the, the second one, you know, Eyes, Eyes Wide Shut. Um, when you look at the analysis that's going on, it's almost his concern about humans being reduced, right, to machines. Right. And um, I've given the example of the robber barons and the crits might have said male dominated hierarchies, right? A privilege, right. would that have been the right way to say it, right? Um, exploiting humans um, as machines. Um, Godard gave us some examples of city nightmares. And I think you referenced this in your work, escape becomes difficult. Um, in fact, in weekend, right? Where they're attempting to leave um there's this um huge car jam right that occurs yeah. and it's almost that even if you try to escape from the reality of you know um the modern norms and everything of, of society you can't um yeah. 
Yeah, let me ask you, um, is the reality so frightening that we must attribute order and principles <laughs> to it? Um, I, I uh, love that you use Weirock, yeah, Professor that must be, Weirock. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's your, uh, that's your, that's the, because we need the eggs part of it. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And if I could, you use the Weirock metaphor, right? Professor Weirock being a, another a, a wonderful professor at the University of Florida, going behind the masks. Yeah. And the rituals course. and law and that, what, Professor, I think we just accepted black letter law. We accepted the rules, the policies, the statutes without questioning them. And it's a fiction, but is it absolutely, a necessary fiction? Absolutely. That, that, that's, that's about, but what would we do without it? What would we do? Yeah. yeah. It's because I mean, we what, need the what eggs. What would we do if we, we, we actually faced up to the reality? I mean, it would be chaos. Exactly. That's you and I, um, I'm not going to put myself on your intellectual capacity, but the students, when sometimes they complain about the laws being complex and confusing, which it certainly is, we, we try to make sense out of it. But, you know, it's something arbitrary by its very nature. Um, you know, a, 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 a strange way this reveals itself is um, students, uh, and I'm sure this is true when you were students, they want to know what is the rule? Yes. Yeah. What All is the, time. the rule? And uh, the answer is, well, I can tell you the rule, but I'll be telling you almost nothing about what happens. Exactly. And the way that I counter it, Professor Harrison is I assume all our students are pretty brilliant, um, you know, and um, I tell them we're an educational institution. I'd like to tell them a little bit about the law and right. taking their information and trying to put them in the driver's seat by giving them the tools ultimately, right. um, you know, and, and hopefully I'm telling them, you know, because we are an academic institution, I'd like to give you some critical thinking tools, right, to use and, and try to apply it. Um, the students that do work in our office, I, I hope, you know, you would appreciate this. They tell us that, the reason they like our office to extern or intern in is because they learn all this theory in the classroom, don't know how to apply it yet. Right. So they get real world cases and they can see, you know, how it's actually applied on it. Yeah. Um, one thing, um, Godard gave us so many liberating techniques um, in terms of um, making films, but he didn't give us any easy answers. Was critical, um, critical legal um, studies also similar in the sense that it raised a lot more questions than giving us answers? Yes. And was it ultimately, now looking back on it 40 years later, do you consider it a path with kind of a dead end? I, I you know, I don't, it's a funny thing if you, if you use the Godard and say Francois Truffaut sort of analogy, a lot of their techniques are in modern film. I mean, uh, jump cuts, freeze frames, things that remind you that somebody is actually behind the scenes manipulating things. I think we do more of that in law school these days than we did 30 years ago. That is, and so, as I said before, maybe some of those insights have sort of seeped into the conventional uh, analysis. One of the follow-up questions I had for you, as attorneys, can we do it on an individual level ourselves? In other words, take some of the insights that you were talking about, and it is seeping in, but for us to actually apply them on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Using holistic I, law, or maybe um, I've come up with functional law, but I think it's critical legal geography was the other. CLG was one of the other, yeah, paths. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know how that would happen other than perhaps in advising a client as to the things that may happen or the options that, that are available. 
uh, it, it, it may be giving them a more realistic view of possible outcomes. Hey, it changed one of my questions here. I had said is, you know, law ultimately like quantum theory, um, you know, is it impossible to predict? But I actually changed it because quantum theory actually makes very good predictions. Um, it's impossible to have certainty. Yeah. I think that's what I meant. And I think it, you were it, making, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, in a way, the uncertainty of law is beneficial because it's because of that uncertainty that 90 some percent of cases settle. If you exactly. knew, and so a greater awareness of those uncertainties actually makes people more likely not to uh, throw the dice and, and see what will happen if they go to trial. Thank you. Remember we used to talk about what did the judge have for breakfast that morning, right? Yeah. Um, and same thing, the unpredictabilities of a judge or jury, right? Way on both sides or multiple parties, right? And it's a part of the equation that we yeah. can't necessarily quantify, right? Or qualify. Um, very good point. Um, my question is, is it easier in art than law, right? To deconstruct and to come up with these amazing theories. Um, Rod Serling, I was listening to an interview by him and he said that the reason that he put all these complex or deeper themes, right? Because he was criticizing politics. He was criticizing socio, you know, economics right. and a lot of things in his stories, but he did them in a sci-fi type of fantasy setting. And he said, you know, that allowed him to, to air it on the CBS, you know, or, or whatever, you know, at the time, whereas if he did a straight story, there's no way, right? They would allow him to do it. Um, do you think the same thing maybe applies in law um, instruction? Uh, maybe in, in legal writing and in, 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 in law legal scholarship. I, I don't know about beyond that, really. Thank you. I'm going to take a brief break if it's okay, and I'd like to do just a very brief part three, if I can, with you about some some of your favorite um, um, film directors. Okay. Great. Get into even deeper fun stuff here.